because of observations, scanning the sky for, for weeks, months, years at a time. Um, I also have managed to address two of the issues raised this morning in my title slide. Um, Saul's issue about where do people go when they are a jack of all trades or a, a, a foot in multiple camps and, and certainly the, the national labs have been very good homes for, for many of us and in particular in a, a Berkeley lab, the physics and the computational research divisions founded the Computational Cosmology Center where Peter and I and, and our groups live um, and the Space Sciences Laboratory which also got a, a mention as a, a, a sort of clearinghouse for, for similar kinds of work. And then Mike's question about what do you do about the fact that your code is getting faster and faster and faster and more and more and more powerful and your brain has limited capacity is you hire people smarter than you. So this is going to be a combination of um, wow, uh, what we've been up to and polemic. And the wow is it's been a really great week for CMB science. Um, somewhat lost in the, in the bicep results were the fact that the polar bear experiment uh, published some points um, out in the lensing part of the, the CMB B-mode spectrum. The B-mode spectrum has sort of been the holy grail for the last few years. Uh, it's five orders of magnitude down from the temperature fluctuations that we've, we've all come to know and love. So extra I mean, extraordinarily faint even by CMB standards. Uh, and so these are all the upper limits from previous experiments. Here are the polar bear data, and here are the bicep data that came out at the beginning of the week um, and have, have provoked such, such a flurry of interest. And, and their uh, quoted number of R of 0.2, much higher than people were expecting, um, partly because they're hiding a multitude of sins in there. This is, this is cosmology plus foregrounds plus systematics plus everything um, notionally in tension with Planck, but certainly once you take out their best foreground model, much of that tension goes away. Here's more like what people were targeting and thinking about. Um, and you can see that there's a lot, of, a lot of energy was over on this end of the spectrum. This is uh, B modes from gra gra lensing of the E mode signal. And this, is, this, this end is the B modes from, uh, from gravity waves in inflation. So the idea was to, to go for this part of the signal first because it was A, known to be there and pretty much known what the amplitude should be, um, and B, it's hard to get. So if you could prove that your experiment worked out here, then you could have some hope that it would push in to this realm. But BICEP went for, for this part and discovered a, a, a signal much higher than was expected. So this has been fantastic, lots and lots of interest. Um, we've always talked about the third Nobel Prize for CMB physics would, would come for this detection. We shall see. Still a lot to do. There are a lot of issues in this data set, and this is, I, I want to highlight a few of these because they feed into to my polemic. Um, so these are exquisitely sensitive detectors, and it, it's, a, it's a three years of data, 512 detectors, enormously sensitive instrument. Um, at the low multipole end of things, it's all cosmic variants. And this misses quite badly. So there's a, a definite deficit of power here. Uh, you can't really see it so much here. This is the temperature mode, by the way. So yeah, this is in the thousands of micro k squared. Go down by a factor of, of three, and you get to the EE spectrum. You can't really see it very well, but you see it better over here. Systematically high. Is this a leakage issue from temperature to polarization? If it is, that's very worrying. Consistent between the... the bicep one and bicep two and across frequencies. So not quite sure what's going on there. Uh, and then the BB spectrum um, has this very large excess uh, in the region where you start going into the, the lens signal, which polar bear had already detected. So we're pretty confident about the level of that. Um, so this is a, a bit of an issue. Um, if you do the same thing with BB and you, you do the, the cross spectra, well, bicep one didn't have such good signal to noise, so the points tend to scatter all over the place, and you get back into the, the cosmologist Rorschach test. You see whatever model you want to see in there. Um, so fortunately for them, they had access to the Keck data. And this is where it gets another thing gets a little, a little um, interesting about the presentation. So, so the Keck data 
when you cross the Keck data with the, the bicep 2 data, um, you get to say, well, this doesn't matter because, look, we get this nice convergence down here, so it's just something going on with, with B2, obviously. But then you are supposed to pay no attention to the, lo the loss of power here. So there are definitely still some, some big systematics questions about this data, um, and these are going to plague all of the, the, the forthcoming data sets that are addressing the same kinds of issues. We're all either have or will be facing exactly these issues. And that's where it gets challenging because the data sets are growing with Moore's Law. So here I've got a selection of experiments ranging from COBE to a putative next generation uh, mission class uber polarization experiment. And you can follow through, you know, between, between COBE and Planck. You've got 15, 20 years and three orders of magnitude between Planck and and the next generation, either satellite or, or enormous ground-based mission, you've got another three orders of magnitude, we're growing with Moore's Law. Um, we can only afford linear or log-linear, maybe, algorithms, and they, they uh, since we're already on the bleeding edge of HPC, we're going to be stuck on that edge for, for the next 15 years, as we have already for 15 years. So um, those are our constraints. Just a, a quick sense of what's coming. Um, all, pretty much all the ground-based experiments are either at the in the Atacama Desert or at the South Pole. We're going to be moving from hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of detectors, possibly combining multiple telescopes, uh, or definitely combining multiple telescopes. And there's a selection of the, the kinds of names to look out for. And this will, as I say, give us about 100 times the Planck data volume. Two proposals, there have been several. There are two sort of floating around at the moment in various stages for the ultimate CMB polarization experiment in the US, coming out of the P5 process to NSF and DOE, and therefore ground-based, uh, multiple telescopes now at multiple sites, so at, in, presumably in the Atacama and at the South Pole, to cover half of the sky um, with up to half a million detectors. Just for reference, Planck has 72. 74, but two don't work. Um, oh no, one of them, they, they, kind of got work, so 73, but clearly a big jump. Um, and core, uh, core probably being reproposed this summer. Um, core with prisms will probably go back to being core because it'll be an M-class core instead of an L-class. Uh, so again, this will be a, a, an ESA call, so a space mission. Um, again, 100% of the sky because it's from, from space and you know, order 100,000 textures. And both of these, we're looking at something like 1,000 times the Planck data volume. So while most of the things I'll talk about will be about Planck, um, that, that we can just use as a sort of a, a scaling point. That we, know, we know that we're already with Polar Bear dealing with 10 times as much data, with the next generations of experiments 100 times, and for the ultimate experiments 1,000 times. So two, two sets of challenges. <laughs> Good luck. Um, enormous data sets needed to get the necessary signals to noise. Um, and because we're using approximate methods, we have to use Monte Carlo's for uncertainty quantification. And we have to have exquisite control of our systematics. So these are the sort of issues we're facing. Everything looks like polarization. Um, and we get issues from the instrument, we get issues from the environment, and we get instrument I issues from the mathematics. And the fact that there's this hierarchy that T to E is a, a factor of 1,000 and E to B is a factor of 100, even you know, a fraction of a percent leakage from temperature into polarization would swap the B signal. And obviously, as you go to fainter and fainter signals, the degree to which you have to, to deal with the systematics drops. The other big problem, which is where I'm going to get polemical, is a sociological one. Uh, Ground-based suborbit experiments are always notoriously underfunded, so the first thing they throw out is any funding for data analysis. So that's all sort of put together with a graduate student and a dog. Um, but conversely, in some sense, I've, I've, I've hoist by my own petard. I mean, we've been successful enough in arguing that the CMB is a massive data challenge and requires high-performance computing, that turning it around, groups that don't want to do that have then said, well, look, we can't do this. This is too computationally expensive, so we'll do something quick and dirty because we're driven to it. And so we get these, these lines that say it's prohibitively expensive to run large sets of simulations. And it's not computationally feasible to do the right thing, so we'll, we'll make an estimate and subtract it. Um, these things may be OK, but you better prove that they're OK before you start doing them. And some of these are, are definitely just false claims. 
So we have lots of computational resources. NERSC has been very good to us. We support 100 users, 10 experiments on the suborbital. Planck has a multi-year allocation. The only project at NERSC that runs uh, has a, a, an allocation guaranteed over many years. We have dedicated hardware. Planck allocation gone, has grown exactly with Moore's Law. Um, and there's all the data management resources. Um, we're planning to put all of the Planck data, including the simulations, including these massive Monte Carlo sets, uh, spinning at NERSC for users for the foreseeable future. Um, and in order to use these kinds of systems, there's the TOAST package. Um, so the, the, the issue here, you know, if the data are going to grow with Moore's Law, then the analysis capabilities better do that too. And if you're going to do that, then you've got to be able to exploit massive parallelism. That's getting harder and harder. Uh, you've got to break the data movement bottlenecks. It all comes down to getting the data to the processors fast enough to exploit the capabilities. Um, we better start expecting architecture dependence. We can see where things are already going with, with GPUs, with mics, with whatever's going to come next, with burst buffers, uh, a, a, a richer memory hierarchy, um, with uh, power constraints. So we can see you know, portability is going to become a harder and harder challenge as, as things have to become more and more exquisitely tuned to a particular machine. So you better be able to build this kind of thing in. Um, and data abstraction. Uh, you'd like to be able to use the same co codes to analyze data from multiple experiments. No two experiments ever use the same data format. Planck, for example, has one, two, three, four formats going, um, even in a single experiment. Um, but it works. So we were able, with, with Planck, with the first Planck data release, we were able to field the largest Monte Carlo set ever, ever fielded for a CMB mission. Um, and certainly, you know, compared to the Act 3 claim that it was just too expensive to do this, we've got 1,000 realizations of the nominal Planck mission and reduced that to a quarter of a million maps. That's a substantial Monte Carlo set. We'd like to go 10 times larger to get down to 1% uncertainties from the Monte Carlo. So 10,000 realization Monte Carlos for this year and next year's Planck releases. <coughs> How do we do that? Well, we started out up here. Uh, this was in, in 2006 when Seaborg was doubled from 3,000 to 6,000 cores. And, uh, and they discovered that the IBM version of MPI had a hard limit of 4096 tasks. Um, so I think IBM did you know, said 4096, 81, 92. And then they said, that'll work. So we were asked to, to run a code on the whole machine. And in six hours, we were able to, to simulate and map one realization of Planck on all of Seaborg. Um, that was all the I.O. bottleneck. It was all about just simulating data, writing it out, reading it back in, and mapping it. So first we solve that, do all, this, all the simulation on the fly. So just run a map making code. And when it goes and asks for the data, that gets simulated under the hood and passed back. So that got us down. This step to, in 2009, running on Franklin, and obviously getting, getting onto much higher concurrencies too. Uh, but exploding as we went to very high concurrencies because of the communication bottleneck. So now you have to go hybrid, obviously. You don't want to be using pure MPI between, so MPI off node and, and threads on node. That gets us this big jump, except it's not quite as simple as that because this, so this is running on Hopper. 24 cores on a node with four memory banks. So now we've got numer effects. And so here I, I'm showing um, running uh, four uh, tasks, each with six threads, eight ta two tasks with 12 threads, and one task with 24 threads. Logarithmic scale. So huge effect here. Definitely want to be running this configuration. On the other hand, when you go out to the very high concurrencies, you get the switcheroo. Now out here, I've got four times as many MPI tasks, because I'm running four per, per node, and now the MPI overhead is going to kill me. So now I have a, a situation where the concurrency I'm running at and the data set I'm running at is going to tell me the configuration I need to be running. The upshot of it is this. You get a thousand realizations of, of Planck noise for a particular set of detectors for a particular duration of the mission. Um, you can see all kinds of systematic issues. You, know, you can see the, the ecliptic poles where we have much higher coverage here and here. Uh, this is noise that is correlated in the time domain over, over extended periods and then mapped. Um, so these are exactly what we need to be able to do the, the kinds of uh, statistical tests on our approximate algorithms. And the next step in this, 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 for this particular simulation, the noise is independent between the detectors. 
We're now in introducing the additional capability to add correlated noise, particularly important for suborbital experiments where atmosphere is such a big issue. So my conclusions, we have this extraordinarily computationally challenging problem. It's dominated by time domain operations and the fact we have to Monte Carlo them. So if I go to a next generation satellite, 10 to the 15 observations, I want to simulate those 10 to the 4 times. There's 10 to the 19. Uh, there's some number of operations per, per, per day term, and you know, we're, we're hitting very large numbers. But we believe they're tractable if we stay on the leading edge of HPC. Uh, it all comes down, as usual, to efficient data movement. Um, and I, I, I just, again, caution that this, this uh, is only going to get harder. Um, and yet, this is happening with Planck, but is very rare in the suborbital community. That's largely because Planck has a huge amount of money to throw at this kind of problem. It has a huge longevity. Um, it's not dependent on the graduate student and their dog. Uh, so there's something that we need to do about that, and I certainly will be approaching Joel about a, a hypac sponsored supported workshop to try and get the CMB data analysis community together and somewhere between outreach, educate, and shame uh, and in particular, my new, my new watchword. You either get to complain about the computational cost or you get to put your pipeline in MATLAB, but not both. Thank you.